right, welcome back to Mush Love from the Mush Room. Another exciting episode we got for you. I am kind of meeting for the first time our boy Maddie Marks. I've heard a lot about him, so it feels like I've known him for about a year, but finally get to uh, meet the man, the myth, the legend. So without further ado, uh, Matt, let's uh, get a little intro from you. Yeah, for sure. So I'm Matt Marks. I am a writer, a a recording artist and a lover of life thing and uh yeah it's a pleasure to be on today um one of the things that danny and i connected on early on in our friendship was just a love for the depth of life digging deeper uh, what that actually looked like to us you know it's it's been a constant journey of just like every single time that we find ourselves at different junctures in our spiritual quest our life just like having another person who is doing the digging to uh, to have these conversations with and open the door um, has been really special. In my life, that's been something that I found um, that I constantly feel the need to nurture is just this sense of, you know, there's a there's a, a an endless depth to anything if you're passionate about it because you're never going to stop digging into it and explore it further. So when you find common ground with people in your passion, that you know, really stir you, um, then it leads you to some really wonderful places because that's when time begins to go out the window. That's all the stuff that all the organizational principles kind of drift away because there's a common love for a thing that drives you to do beyond what's. So I've kind of been into that in the latter part of life and it put me in circles that have been filling to, uh, to growth. And so Yo. That's where I'm um sorry to interrupt real quick matt in your audio settings can you turn off your noise gate it's just uh it's or like there's a gate setting it's just cutting in and out because uh when when you're or maybe that's only on my end but uh, no i, I yeah i heard it too i was gonna say something actually i want to hear all your all your beautiful words and all their glory um, okay so should i turn my input sensitivity all the way down yeah, yeah i think that's, yeah that's good now Okay, is this better? Way better. Yeah, it was just cutting out okay. when you got quiet. That's that's pretty. Sorry perfect. about that, guys. No, I could. No, hear no you. worries. Glad we got that situated in the beginning. So, um, what's called? I definitely like hearing all of that. It sounds like you're super passionate about life, which I like. Um, how did you meet Danny? Actually, so it's a funny <laughs> story. Actually, both of us are the type to not normally have been found out, especially during this era of our life. Uh, at a party. We were both in the West Philadelphia area. I was at the time attending Drexel uh, and Danny was living in the Drexel area. And through a friend of a friend, I was invited out to a house party and I was kind of, you know, I didn't have anything else going on. And I really, you know, was, I was in that place where I was like, ah, you know, I, I should go. I should make an appearance, say hello to everybody. So I go to said party and upstairs in one of the bedrooms where they have, you know, their studio set up, was yeah. Danny and a collection of other individuals. And just immediately, you know, uh, in the introductions and kind of going around and meeting everybody, one of these conversations that I alluded to earlier, uh, where we just cut completely bypassed the small talk. I think pretty much after I knew <laughs> Danny's name, we were talking yeah. about, you know, the future of music and, and how we believe that there was a renaissance coming where, you know, the, the timelessness of, you know, really vibrational, resonant, uh, frequencies was going to come back through the nature of like really impassioned creators. And so we were having one of these conversations, you know, not even two minutes into knowing each other. <laughs> and, it, mm. and it was at that moment that I kind of realized I was like, you know, this is that, that affirmation of, you know, you never know who's going to come into the fold. You just have to be open to, to this mm -hmm. resonance, you know, cause in these moments, it's like, I may have never met this individual in my life up until this point, but we just connected on something that, it would have taken, you know, your, your average other person a long time to, if I were to sit, it's, it's someone I care about a lot. If I sat them down and wanted to get them to that level of like, okay, let's connect on this. Let's converse on this. So when somebody on a completely different path, having a completely different journey, we can just come and have this collision point and just be, you know, so step, step for step with our understanding about it. It was like, clearly this is a person that needs to remain in the fold and that I want to continue to grow with because it's already such a, a complex landscape to navigate this life and, and, and the world at large. So to have somebody uh, that you can uh, that can act as a sounding board and, and really feels like a, a mirror that's not refracting in ways that aren't truly reflective of you, 
Because I feel like mm -hmm. a lot of people, the way that they encircle themselves with people, you know, we're all mirrors in different ways, but there's there are refraction points when you're not truly aligned with the people that you're with. And so mm -hmm. when you really do completely resonate and, and are on the same frequency of the people that you surround yourself with, it enables you to be more vulnerable and honest and understand yourself better because you're not afraid to share that with the people and hear it back in a way that, you know, I, I recently had a breakthrough with some of my friends where, I, you know, I, I just started voicing all these negative thoughts that I just would normally let rattle around just to hear someone else potentially be like, that's, that's lunacy. Stop it. Mm -hmm. Like, that's absurd. Because otherwise you're stuck in your own echo chamber. And so to have yep. people that you can be like, hey, listen, I just had this thought. Might be crazy. I might just be, you know, a little bit in my head a little bit. And uh, But just to have people to say, hey, this is what I'm thinking and, and not feel like you're going to get a judgmental response is, is everything. Definitely. I, I think um, a good friend is actually one who's going to say no sometimes. A lot of people think a good friend is someone who just like always agrees with you and always is down. And like, no, that's not actually a good friend. That's like an enabler. Um, reminds me of actually a conversation I think I had with Danny on a previous episode about this guy, um, Tony Hasaya or something, um, founder of, I believe it was founder of Zappos uh, Shoes. And he basically, millionaire, surrounded himself with a bunch of uh, friends who basically no one would ever say no to him. He just... Um, he paid everyone around him a lot of money. So people kind of felt inclined to just be yes men and always say yes, yes, yes. And he went down like a, a slippery slope of doing drugs. He was experimenting a lot with um, uh, whippets. And I think um, people realized like it wasn't the best, but no one kind of was able to say no to him. And he ended up uh, killing himself or dying. So um, definitely agree with that of like, you don't want just people in echo chamber always repeating what you say. You want some people with like different insights, different um, things to say. Um, so one of the first things I heard about you, I think was probably because uh, similar to you, I had a great conversation with Danny right off the jump. Uh, I think we started talking about uh, DMT maybe within three minutes and like <laughs> seeing, seeing aliens and, uh, and all of that. But um, I think then he mentioned Matt, he's like, oh, my boy Matt would love like to talk about all of this. Um, and he mentioned you as a psychonaut. So I guess, um, what would you, uh, where is your like psychonaut journey begin? Um, how would you like, uh, I guess, explain your psychonaut journey? And then a um, little funny question is like, how uh, quickly were you guys able to realize that you're both into that? Because I feel like that's a conversation i probably wait until like this at least the second time meeting someone um to drop that like i see aliens in uh alternate dimensions and stuff <laughs> yeah definitely so this is this will be a fun one so this started probably i want to say i was 18 years old and i really started getting into uh the pink floyds and the Jimi hendrixes of the music world and really exploring like the context of everything and that kind of really piqued my interest early on. And my group of high school friends, we were all, you know, we consumed uh, cannabis rather heavily. That was kind of our go-to. I mean, we would drink and, and do other stuff, but like mostly our, you know, our centering point was just like chilling around, smoking up, listening to music, whether it was Kid Cudi, whatever was contemporary. Kid Cudi was another aspect of, of what kind of introduced the thought of, of this exploration into, into our circle. But mm. one thing came to another and over the winter break, I want to say of uh, my senior year of high school, uh, I had my first LSD experience and it was very mild because it was one tab of blotter and it was, you know, kind of the, the beginnings of, okay, this is what this begins to feel like. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I was, you know, very, I was kind of on the forums and really exploring everything. It was kind of like, yeah, I didn't, I, that, that wasn't quite tripping. You know, that wasn't, mm -hmm. you know, it was kind of like, huh. So that's just really piqued my interest because I really like what I did explore this kind of like, you know, pre, you know, re really pre ethereal space where I was just really feeling myself. And, you know, I, I, I remember just having a having a deep experience with a photograph in my buddy's in my buddy's family room and just like really connecting with it on a different level and feeling that it was just opening me up in a certain type of way. So some time had passed beyond that. And I just continued, I, I, I love to read about things. So I, I was doing a ton of reading um, about it and realizing that 
in terms of uh, the way that it was presented from the from the media narrative and from in my lifetime that I had so many misconceptions about even what it was and its history and and, and, and all these things and began to you know even though I was in the early stages kind of be a crusader for it because I was mm-hmm. like I recognized that so many people had this misconception about what it was and I am somebody who you know I, I like to feel I like to feel very secure in my decisions through through running it through my own you know rationale through the, my own cycles and as long as that's true I don't feel any you know outward pressure to like change that so for me that was a big part of you know this early exploration was just like this realization that okay like people who've done this have long been ostracized for doing so and there's a reason for that and kind of having this awareness of this kind of pressure and release of the you know the countercultural systems and kind of this exploration throughout time where the where the psychedelic experience has fallen into everything. So fast forward a little bit later into winter break, we had an experience where uh, the same person who put us in contact with our with our first blotter gave us a new one, and he was kind of like, this stuff is stronger. It didn't really say much else beyond that. So first time I took one, this time I took two. Um, mm. Turns out he wasn't lying, and this yeah. time two was uh, like 500 micrograms, and yeah. I had my first like really, really heavy experience um, my friends all, they stuck with one. So they had their first experience with it. they pushed beyond the threshold. But one of the things that immediately, uh, spoke to me beyond just, you know, the, how, how, how vibrant, uh, and, 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 and how cl- the clarity of my emotion was, there was, it was clear to me and clear to my friends that I was having a much easier time navigating this space and like, mm. and, and, and working with it. You know, it wasn't like, Oh, like I was, you know, locked to the couch, like staring at the wall. I was kind of like, yeah. oh my God, like, you know, let's, well, let's talk about this. Let's explore this. Oh my God. It would be so cool if we listened to this right now. Or like, you know, I was, I remember I was over in the corner. I was like, yo guys, I like grabbed an ice cube out of the freezer tray and I like put it right on my pinion. <laughs> like, this, is, this is doing something for me right now. Like, yo, just try <laughs> I gotta try that one. <laughs> yeah, bro, for sure. I was just, I was just early on. I was just very much like, okay, there's a lot to once it was like somebody opened the playpen and they were like, yeah. this is here, this is here to explore. And this has been here. And I was just kind of like, okay, I need to have a lot of reverence for this. And, and I'm deeply appreciative for this experience. And I got to kind of make a way that I can continue to find my way back here and, and continue to build on this. So immediately right. it was clear that I wanted to work on the integration aspects of it too, because I found like that, you know, one of the things that, you know, the warnings per se of going into an experience like this, especially a heavy one, is that there's going to be a deeply emotional, you know, mm. uh, a, a weight to, you know, if you if you come to a thought, if you come to something that's under the rug per se, it's going to percolate to the top and it's, you're going to have to work with it. And mm-hmm. so that was, to me, in those moments, it gets very intense and distressing and it's helpful to have people to work through it with. But, and this is something I, I would not advise, you know, uh, to somebody going through, I, I would advise always trying to have somebody with you. But what it forced me to do, because a lot of my exploration beyond that began to be solo exploration was to be my own uh, source of resolution. And a lot of that came through writing uh, and came through channeling mm-hmm. these experiences into a way that I could get myself to flow through my writing and not like, I talked to a lot of people and especially a lot of people who I'm like, I took this much and then I sat and I wrote for eight hours and they're like, what the fuck? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's kind of, it's kind of, it, it takes a lot to get to the place where you're beyond that. That's what you're doing because yeah. what, to me, what it is, it's getting out of my own way so that the space here that I'm writing from, that I can ignore all the stuff that would normally get me distracted. That would normally mm-hmm. Like, look, you've been here for six hours. What are you doing? But when you're so immersed in the thing, so like that was a big part of my process that I discovered for, you know, at that time I was in uh, community college in film school and I was just writing some of my earliest screenplays. So mm-hmm. I was, uh, and I was also at that period of time not using cannabis um, during this period of exploration. So one of the things I learned was I would have these kind of blowout experiences once a month you know, once every three weeks where I would take, you know, a heavy dose and I would just go in my room. Uh, I would, I would queue up 
some Pink Floyd. I would queue up some, you know, at that point I started to experiment with the, with the music of the Grateful Dead that I fell deep down the rabbit hole in. But I would put on my headphones and just like rock out and get to this really, really intense psychedelic space. And then I would, once it got really, really intense, and that's when I knew that it was the most intense at that peaking point, then I was like, okay, because that, that to me, it's like a, you know, it's a three act experience. At, once you get to that point, then it's like, okay, then the more, even more exciting part almost happens for me because it's like, then how can we channel it? Because then mm-hmm. you get to that, that back art where you're like, okay, I just had this entire, this rocket ship of a come up to this place where it went from, you know, zero to 100 and now we're here. And now it's like, okay, now we're here. What can we do with this? And so from that space, it was like all these ideas, all these ideas that I had had, um, you know, I would open up these notes and open up these journals and begin to dig into it and begin to have like this, you know, this worldview of things and, and kind of this, this exploded out, expanded view of, of the hard drive, if you will. Um, and that's how I really began to work with it. So my exploration from that point on, you know, it can, cont- there continued to be moments where like I, I, I pushed to new territory and had, you know, times that were overwhelming and especially helping other people work through experiences. But Mm. one thing I did learn is that when I dialed in the set and setting, which for me especially was a solo experience where I know that I'm not going to be disturbed and I have queued up, you know, intentions and things that I want to do, you know, that I had a very high success rate with going in and coming out, not only with, you know, a, a, a powerful and profound experience with, you know, even if there was nothing tangible, but oftentimes a lot of tangible creative material would come through it by nature of just being so attuned with being able to pull all these things together and being in a space where, you know, you talk about, you know, changing the, the neural networks and, and reconditioning the mind, you know, mm. through a lifetime of being taught to think a certain way, when you are able to indulge in these experiences and work with them, you know, you talk about how, you know, and you look at studies about how these experiences, you know, uh, resemble the childlike state of neurons firing because there's not these compartmentalizations that are built up. So yeah. really what I would visualize on top of what I would experience was these networks breaking down all of these formulations and all these pockets that a lifetime of conditioning within a society was trying to put on. OK, here's how you're supposed to think about this. I would just continue to. I really, I really need to find the study one day, but there's, there's a, it's almost like a brain glue is how it was described Mm. to me in terms of how we hold ideas. And there's like a little bit of elbow grease internally required to like get that glue off because it's why we're initially resistant to changing the idea. And this was one of my first fundamental understandings with like questioning everything in these states. It was like, okay, well, you know, well, this is how I've always thought about this. So this is how I've always done this. But why? What what stems from that? And and really picking at that. And right. that kind of ethos uh, really permeated through life. And, and it came from this nature of like, this experience is is reality. You know, it, it is a, in the same way that, you know, when we wake up in the morning, we are, you know, the result of our reality is a state of our brain chemistry and how we perceive the world. When we introduce different neurochemicals and different compounds to our system, you know, this is the reality. It's as real to us as anything. And this is one of the big reasons why I try to steer people away from calling entheogens hallucinogens is because Mm -hmm. I've never seen anything or experienced anything that I did not believe was real under the influence of these substances. If anything, they were more real and more visceral and more impactful than the days between and so for that reason, I think, you know, it's important that we have that conversation as well as a community at large, because I think that painting it as such, you know, a classical, you know, classical hallucinogens, all the literature, there's a lot of stuff that, that, that is, and it's a very simple, very simple way to frame it that I think gives people this impression mm-hmm. that it's Negative. about, mm-hmm. exactly. And it's about this, like, you know, this show of like, you take this thing and then everything's woo. And like, that is such a small piece of the puzzle. You yeah. Know? It's such I, a small piece of the puzzle. I definitely agree. I, I could listen to you talk for the whole day. I love, uh, you got a lot of good insights and, um, just the way you talk is, uh, is kind of mesmerizing. Um, I could, yeah, very, uh, insightful. I, I enjoyed that. I guess, um, I want to 
have a little question for Danny um, before we have to wrap up is um, do you, do you guys, um, I know you've like tripped before. Um, do you guys ever like intend to microdose on the same day? Does that like help uh, you in the studio to like, I know Matt was saying kind of um, taking LSD might help him get into a flow state so he can just write for eight hours. Does it help if you're with someone else to like get onto the same flow state or is that like a uh, pretty difficult to do it's really like on your own so no absolutely um pretty early on when i started microdosing with mushmore i uh i definitely uh had matt hit them up as well and kind of you know get on the wave and stuff so i mean th just to go back to to your previous question you said like w when did we have the conversation about psychedelics and stuff like that mm -hmm. too and it'll tie in well to what matt said about writing and everything too the funny thing is, is like we had met at that party, like he was uh, saying earlier. And then I was like, oh my God, this dude's incredible. He was like freestyling over a beat, me and the homies were making and everything. And um, I was like, all right, well, we got to get Matt through my studio. Cause like their setup was like, you know, a tiny little kind of whatever corner room, but not a, the best setup. So I was like, all right, we should all come back to my house one time, like intentionally try to make a beat for Matt and like let him do his thing. You know what I mean? Cause I was like, he deserves it. And it's funny because I had no, there was a couple of things I didn't know at the time, but I didn't know that that was Matt's first time in a true studio environment, like kind of really spitting into a microphone. He had a uh, background in choir and music throughout his upbringing, but, um, but yeah, so he's sitting there, me and three other producers were making this phenomenal beat, this phenomenal song or whatever. And um, Matt like was just, you know, pad and you know I'd, you know pen and pad just whatever quiet in the corner or whatever and then venus stop sorry the cat is tweaking um <laughs> but so he's he's writing in in the corner and stuff and then at some point i think he like kind of slipped in casually like yeah i'm off a couple cup off a couple tabs that might help the creativity or just like said it so right. nonchalant and i had no idea because matt is like extremely grounded all right let me just let the cat in hold up he's yeah crazy. i think oh. i actually I think I heard about this um, initial freestyle and like you recorded it. You still have the recording of it, right? It was so the funny part is, is this was this song wound up. It was the first song that we he had done on, into the studio environment, the first song we did together. But it wound up like more than a year later, it wound up being the outro to his first project. So it was kind of right. funny because we made that together. He went out to uh, California for an internship. And then that song that we made, which was the first one in cr the chronology became the outro of the project that his first project. So that was super funny, but he just casually mentioned that. And I was like, wait, what? Like you're off of how yeah. much right now? And like, he was just so grounded and collected. So that's when I knew I was like, oh, this dude is a special breed. But um, going back to the, what you just said about microdosing. So like, when um when when I got onto the journey pretty early, Matt probably started a couple months after me. And uh, yeah, I think there was definitely some days where he would come over to the studio and it'd be like, oh, like you 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 microdose. We we wouldn't go out of our way to, but it would just kind of like sync up. You know what I mean? We're like, oh, mm -hmm. okay. Well, it's kind of like that nod, like okay. And but, even on even on days that we weren't like that we weren't seeing each other that week, we would kind of like have discourse back and forth, like. I would be like, oh, yo, what, you know, what regimen are you doing this week? Or like, what days right. are you Fatiman, rocking? And it Stamets, would just, yeah, like yeah, for sure. And it would just kind of be one of those things, too, where I feel, you know, I, and I do this similarly with, with art that I share with my friends. Um, like, we'll pick a movie and we'll sync up and watch it. And we'll pick, you know, an album, right. we'll sync up and watch it. And I think there's a lot of value to that. And so right. in the same way, I really do. It's like, it's cool to know, you know, and it's cool when we catch up. It's like, Oh, yo, how did your last week go? Knowing that like, okay, on Tuesday and Thursday or Tuesday and Friday, however we chose to rock out, whatever, you know, whatever the case was, it's like, okay. And we get yeah. to talk about that and have this tangible because we both in the same way, you know, we were both living this life, running around, we come back and it's not like, it's almost, there's almost more value in those conversations than when we share the day together because it's like, when we share the day, we're having kind of a collectivized experience that's kind of right. fed into by both being on that. But when we're both, on this level, we're both tuned up a little bit and we're having our separate experiences. It's like, oh my gosh, you know, I, was pushing back, I was pushing back this boundary and I was doing this and then I, I didn't even realize and I forgot. And by 3 p.m. I was like, oh, that's right. This morning I had a little bit extra, you know, a little bit of extra vitamins. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 uh, and then by that point, you know, you're, you're laughing because it's, it, it is funny because there's objective nodal points of like, 
like you said, more data points separated. We come back together and it's like, oh no, like there yeah. is something was, there. You know, yeah. Yeah. Something, yeah. And I sure. think, I think one of the things that we both immediately noticed too, I mean, other than like creativity and just like general calm, good feelings was cause Matt's been on a, a really impressive uh, fitness weight loss journey as well over the past year and stuff. And when right. I started microdosing, um, I think we've talked about this a little bit on the podcast, but I've always noticed that microdosing really helps me work out. It helps with the mind to mm-hmm. muscle connection and helps me focus on my breathing pattern and breath is everything. When you're working out, that's where a lot of your strength and endurance and everything comes through. So I think that was one of the main things me and Matt, like, where the, the, you know, separate days or whatever, but the data points where we're like, oh, there's some commonalities because Matt would be like, dude, I was running today and like I, I microdosed this morning and I just, I was able to catch my breath in a different way. And I was, I, I was, I, he's like, I ran three extra miles and didn't even realize because I was so in a flow. And I w- I'd be like, yeah, dude, I was lifting earlier and fucking, uh, you know, I microdosed and I was like, I went for two and a, like normally I'll work out for an hour and a half. It was two and a half hours and I was like setting personal records and stuff like that. So I do think it really, really helps with that that mind to muscle or like mind to body uh bridge and you know that's that's everything too because it's like th- that just helps with the intentionality so um yeah it's definitely really cool and like we've definitely both seen a lot of benefits from it um it was cool too because like again some some variables in our studies or whatever like i've been pretty true to the fatiman for almost the entire time but there was like i think a week or two where matt was doing stamets and he's like honestly like i could see myself doing this because it just seems like you know you're just taking a morning supplement and it just was giving consistent good results so yeah it's it's really awesome to be able to compare and contrast definitely Oh, sorry, Jeremy. Go ahead. No, no. Go ahead. You're good. I was just going to say that beyond the mind to muscle, one of the things that I really noticed in exploring my physicality while taking the supplements <clears throat> was that I was able to let let this little bit – because having such a deep connectivity with uh, the far out of these experiences, letting that little bit of divine spark come through and have that be kind of the power that comes through beyond the mind to muscle is like – you know, at six o'clock in the morning when I'm out on my run, when I'm looking for that extra dig deep, like there is that little bit of like, you know, mother earth energy, like that little bit of divine spirit, like that extra light, mm-hmm. you know, that uh, mm-hmm. as, as Bob Weir, the Grateful Dead says, that little bit of extra, extra shimmer in your eyes. Because he, yep. he's, he's, he's another one that advocates heavily and he still has, you know, a, a microdosing protocol and he's, you know, he's kicking and still rocking stages into his mid 70s. So there's yeah. def- there's definitely some proof in the pudding and uh and and even objectively what we've experienced just like this really resonant sense of like fully you know bringing all the pieces together and, and especially when you push your limits and i find that in anything when you push your limits that's really when everything's revealed is you kind of see where you know where the auxiliary the auxiliary boosters actually are you know you see what it, what is capable and then what is beyond capable and you kind of bring everything into the fold but uh it was it really has been a beautiful you know opportunity to to learn from each other and through and learn from ourselves through this process definitely i agree well, um again i loved hearing from you i uh learned a lot i got uh definitely a lot of cool stories uh, some of them i think i've heard a little bit uh at least parts of before from danny but um hopefully we can have you on again sometime in the future because Feel like there's still so much more we can discuss Absolutely. um but i think that's about all for today do you guys have any closing thoughts before we wrap it up um uh, i'll you go I'll, ahead first, i'll just Dan. say uh yeah it's i'm glad to get matt on here definitely uh one of the people who's taught me a lot about um you know the 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 divine realm and the you know just has helped me grow as a person and we like you said jeremy you're like we could have these conversations all day now that we live in the same house we do have these conversations all day yeah, we, awesome. we really we really dig deep and uh get to explore that that pattern and i think it's cool like we were saying earlier having people uh that that really are good reflection points where you can you know be real with one another we can we can disagree in healthy ways we can you know come to conclusions together so uh yeah it's really exciting to get uh one of my brothers on the on the podcast to share his experiences and uh we'll definitely probably have an episode two or three or five or ten with matt because uh i know he's got plenty more insights and uh, value to offer on the topic but uh but yeah just grateful as always and i'll i'll pass it over (laughs) i just want to say to everybody um one of the biggest takeaways that i've had from life in general is that fear uh exists within the unknown and within the unknown also exists 
all the things that we couldn't even have possibly imagined, uh, the splendorous things, the wonderful things. So the reason that we fear things is because we've yet to experience them and, there, and that there's a discomfort in that. And, and our imagination, it works in both ways. We can picture you know, a wonderful future for ourselves and we can picture contentment and peace for ourselves and we can also terrorize ourselves and have thoughts that make us uncomfortable. So I think that leaning into things that tap into this primal sense of, of fear and, uh, and new frontiers, it makes us stronger and it makes us more resilient and loving people because it enables us uh, to be reminded of our own humanity uh, and how, how grateful we should be for just each day and each opportunity to create and love and be. And uh, so, yeah, that's my message to the people. And I definitely thank you so much for, for giving us the platform to, to have this conversation. And I would be honored to be back to share some more of my travels and, so, you know, <laughs> with new lessons along the way. Hell yeah, sounds good. Thank you, as always. And uh, if you guys are into music, check out Maddie Marks. Is that, is that what you go by on uh, Apple Matt Music? Marks. I go by Matt Marks. That's, that's, Matt Marks. That's who I am. That's who you get, man. <laughs> Matt Marks, Danny Camp, good ass music. Check them out. Thanks as always. Much love from the mushrooms. Much See you guys love, soon. Guys. Much love. Hell much yeah. Love. Be well, everybody.